Murrah McDermott O'Brien, 1st Earl of Inchiquin and 6th Baron Inchiquin, was known as Merchard Nato Etian, of Irish who would not convert to Anglicanism and their land, crops, livestock, and dwellings. O'Brien studied war in the Spanish service and fought against the Confederate Catholics on the outbreak of the Irish Rebellion of 1641. He was made governor of Munster in 1642 and had some small success, but was hampered by lack of funds. Sidney Lee states that he outwitted the Irish leader, Don McCarty, second Viscount Muskerry, with threats and promises. O'Brien persuaded Muskerry to delay attacking the garrisons at Capaquin and Lismore until a truce was brokered by a representative of King Charles, I, after which O'Brien forces dispersed. O'Brien visited Charles I at Oxford in 1644. He was forced to submit to Parliament in 1644, as the parliamentarians being masters of the sea, were therefore the only people who could help the Munster Protestants. He was made President of Munster, supplies having been brought to him by Philip Sidney in 1647. O'Brien gradually became Master of the South of Ireland, and declared for Charles I in 1648, fortified the southern ports against Parliament and signed a truce with the Confederate Catholics. He was joined by James Butler, 1st Duke of Ormond, with whom he got possession of Drogheda and Dundalk. O'Brien lost influence in Munster, which revolted after Cromwell's landing, 1649, but made a stand at Kilmore Lock in 1649. He retired to the west of the Shannon and then left Ireland for France in 1650 where he became one of the Royal Council and in 1654 was created Earl of Inchiquin. He served under the French in Catalonia in 1654 and was engaged in the Sexby Plot in 1656 and in the same year became a Roman Catholic. He was taken prisoner by the Algerines in 1660, but ransomed the same year and became high steward of Queen Henrietta Maria's household. He lived quietly in Ireland after 1663. Early life Inchiquin was the eldest son of Dermot O'Brien, 5th Baron of Inchiquin, by Ellen, eldest daughter of Sir Edmund Fitzjohn Fitzgerald of Cloyne and Ballamalo House and Honora Fitzmaurice, second daughter of James of Desmond. His grandfather and namesake was killed in July 1597 at the passage of the urn, fighting for Queen Elizabeth I. It appears from an inquisition taken after the death of his father that Inchiquin was born in September 1614. His wardship was given to Patrick Fitzmaurice and the custody of his property to Sir William Street, Ledger, Lord President of Munster, whose daughter he married. He had a special livery of his lands in 1636, and afterwards went to study war in the Spanish service in Italy. He returned in 1639, and prudently yielded to Thomas Wentworth, 1st Earl of Strafford's high-handed scheme for the colonization of Clare. In a letter to Wentworth, Charles I took notice of this and directed that he should not, in course of plantation have the fourth part of his lands in that county taken from him as from the other the natives there. On the 2nd of April 1640 he was made Vice President of Munster, and sat as a peer in the Irish Parliament which Strafford held that year. The Irish Rebellion the Great Irish Rebellion began on 23 October 1641, and in December in Shikine accompanied the President in an expedition against the Leinster rebels who were harassing Waterford and Tipperary. All the prisoners taken in a fight near Carrick on shore were executed by martial law. In April 1642, during the siege of Cork by Viscount Muskerry with 4,000 men, in Shikine, one of the young and noble-spirited commanders led a sally of two troops of horse and 300 musketeers, which broke up the Irish camp for a time. Muskerry left baggage and provisions behind, and in Shikine was able to ship guns and to take two castles on the west side of Cork Harbour which had annoyed the navigation. Saint Ledger died on 2 July, and in Shikine became the legal governor of Munster, as he announced to the Lord's Justices before the end of the month. 
David Barry, 1st Earl of Barrymore, was associated with him in the civil government, but died on Michaelmas Day. Alexander Forbes, 11th Lord Forbes, with Hugh Peters as his chaplain, landed at Kinsale early in July with forces provided by adventurers in England, but he paid no attention to Inchicken's request for help and he effected nothing. On 20 August in Chiquine, accompanied by Barrymore, Viscount Boyle of Kanamiki, and Roger Boyle, Lord Brohill, with only 2,000 foot and 400 horse, overthrew General Garrett Barry at Battle of Liscarroll with 7,000 foot and 1,500 horse, but he lacked means to improve his victory. Though 700 are said to have fallen on one side and only 12 on the other, he was himself wounded in the head and hand. Richard Boyle, 1st Earl of Cork, and his sons did much to preserve the counties of Cork and Waterford, and in Shikine cooperated with them, but not cordially. The difficulty was to support an army on any terms. In November 1642 in Chicken seized all the tobacco in the hands of the patentees at Cork, Yall, and Kinsale, and no compensation was paid until after the restoration. The cattle and corn in the districts under his control were taken of course. The king had no money to give, and the English Parliament had neither time to attend to Ireland nor money to entrust to unsafe hands. Inchiquine gave a commission to the commandant at Yule as early as 26 July 1642 to execute martial law there upon both soldiers and civilians, and his dealings with the town are recorded in the council book. The raw material of soldiers was abundant, for fighting was now the only industry, but there were no means of paying them. Yet the English Parliament sent men to Ireland without arms, for no purpose, wrote in Chiquine to James Butler, 1st Duke of Ormond, unless it be to plot that these men shall with jawbones kill so many rebels. At the end of May 1643 he took the field with 4,000 foot and 400 horse but could only threaten and kill Morlock, for want of provisions and money for the offices, and he begged the Earl of Cork to lend or borrow 300 pounds for victualling Yule. While threatening Keensale himself, he sent one detachment as far as Trali, who had to subsist on a country then in Irish hands. Another small force was sent to Fermoy, but suffered a crushing defeat at Clole on the 4th of June from a body of horse under James Touche, 3rd Earl of Castle Haven, who had been specially sent by the Kilkenny Confederation. Muskerry threatened the county of Waterford, and in Chiquine, according to his own account, intrigued with him until he was in a position to fight. The Irish leader offered to spare Yule and its district if Capricorn and Lismore surrendered at once, otherwise he would burn both places. By a mixture of threats and promises in Shikin induced him to say that he would withdraw if Capricorn and Lismore were not token by a certain day. Until that date had passed he was not to be attacked. In Chiquine had so garrisoned Capiquin as to make it safe for a much longer time, and the Earl of Cork's Lismore Castle was also well prepared. The situation was maintained with little sincerity on either side until Cork himself landed with orders from Charles I to promote a truce. Active hostilities ceased, and Muskerry, who had been outwitted, tried to be even within Shikin by telling the king that he designed to betray the two towns to the Irish, a statement without foundation. If ever, he wrote to an officer who had been present during the whole period, I did anything towards the defence of Munster against the Irish. This was what I had cause to brag of, cessation of arms. The cessation of arms for a year, which Ormond, at the king's command, concluded with the Confederates on 15 September 1643, was formally approved by Enshikeen in a document which he signed along with Marquis of Clan Ricard and many other persons of distinction. But he did not think it really favourable to the cause of the Irish Protestants. The immediate result was that a great part of the force under his orders was sent to serve the king in England, two regiments being assigned to Lord Hopton in Sussex, and the rest scattered under various leaders.
800 of Inshikan's men, described as native Irish rebels, landed at Weymouth under his brother Henry, and some were hanged as such. Though their old general was by that time serving the English parliamentary cause, his own regiment of horse went over before the cessation, and was present before Gloucester in August and September, but did little except plunder the country. Parliamentary Allegiance in Shikine went to Oxford early in February 1644, his main object being to get the King's commission as President of Munster, but a formal promise had already been given to Jerome, Earl of Portland, who received a patent for life on 1 March. Ormond was against slighting a man who had done great service in Ireland for the sake of one who had done nothing at all, but his advice was neglected, and in Shikine was dismissed with fair words. He had a warrant from the king for an earldom, but this he forbore to use. He left Oxford after a stay of about a fortnight, apparently in tolerable humour, but it was soon known in Ireland that he came discontented from court. What he saw at Oxford was not likely to raise his estimate of the king's power, and in any case the English Parliament were masters of the sea, and the only people who could help the Protestants of Munster. A visit to Dublin on his way did not change his opinion, and in July he and his officers urged the king, in a formal address, to make peace with his Parliament. At the same time they called upon the Houses to furnish supplies for prosecuting the war against the Irish. In November 1642 in Shikine had told Ormond that he was no roundhead, and in August 1645 he assured his brother-in-law, Michael Boyle, the future primate and chancellor, that he would waive all dependence on the English Parliament if he could see safety for the Protestants by any other means, and between these dates. He made many appeals to Ormond not to desert the Protestants for an Irish alliance, exposing the apparent practice of the Irish Papists to extirpate the Protestant religion, which I am able to demonstrate and convince them of, if it were to any purpose to accuse them of anything. In June 1644 in Shikine was going to leave for England. But Ormond advised him to wait until he had cleared himself from Muscari's charges about the Capricorn business. During the next few weeks he edged away both from the Confederate Catholics and from Ormond, and on 25 August 1644 he informed the latter that a parliamentary ship had reached Yule, that the town had embraced that cause and that he should have to do the same, and he entreated him to put himself at the head of the Protestant interest. In August in Shikine expelled nearly all the Roman Catholics from Cork, Yule, and Kinsale, and they were allowed to take only as much property as they could carry on their persons. All the Irish inhabitants are the words used by this chief of the O'Briens. The English Parliament made in Shikine president of Munster, and he continued to act without reference to Portland, Oregon to Ormond, who was the King's Lord Lieutenant. Receiving no supplies from England, he managed to keep the garrisons together, and, although he had opposed the general armistice, was forced to make a truce with the Irish in the winter of 1644-5. The Siege of Duncannon, which Lawrence Esmond, Lord Esmond held for the English Parliament, was nevertheless preceded with, and at its surrender, on 18 March 1646, it was found that Esmond had been acting under in Shikin's directions, although the fort is not in Munster. The truce expired 10 April 1645, and Castle Haven at once invaded Munster with 6,000 men, reducing most of the detached strongholds easily, capturing Inshikin's brother Henry, and ravaging the country to the walls of Cork. Inshikin was active, but too weak to do much, and on 16 April Castle Haven came before Yule, which was valiantly defended by Brohill. The latter took the offensive early in May with his cavalry, and won a battle near Castle Leons. Inshikin sent in many supplies by sea from Cork, in which he had the help of Vice Admiral John Crowther's squadron. A larger convoy was sent by the English Parliament after the Battle of Naseby and in September Brohill, who had been to England for help, finally relieved the place. 
At the end of the year in Shikin induced his kinsman, Barnabas O'Brien, 6th Earl of Thomond, to admit parliamentary troops into Bunrati Castle, near Limerick, but it was retaken in the following July. Campaign of 1647. On the 5th of January 1646, the English House of Commons voted that Ireland should be governed by a single person, and on the 21st of January that that person should be Philip Sidney, Lord Lyle, who had already seen service in that country. Ormond's treaty with the Confederate Catholics, to which Inchiquin was no party, was ratified on the 29th of July 1646 but was denounced by Archbishop Giovanni Battista Rinaccini and the clergy adhering to him. It had, however, the effect of checking active warfare in Munster. Lull did not land at Cork until March 1647, when he brought money, arms, and a considerable body of men. He did little or nothing, and, his appointment expiring in April, in Shikin produced his own commission under the Great Seal of England and declined to acknowledge any other. The officers of the army pronounced in their old leader's favour, and amusing details of the proceedings are given by Bellings. Brahill opposed in Shikine, but Admiral Crowther took his part, and Lyle was not sorry to get away on any terms. In Shikine remained in entire possession of the command, and in greater reputation than he was before, he reported to Parliament in person on the 7th of May, and received the thanks of the House of Commons. In Shikine now proceeded to reconquer the districts which Castle Haven had overrun, Capaquin and Romana, against which he had cherished designs since 1642, were easily taken. There was a little fighting at Dungarvan, and twenty English redcoats, who had deserted to the Irish, were hanged, but on the whole in Shikin's men thought him too lenient. This was early in May, and he took the field again at midsummer. On 12 August he reported to William Lenthal, Speaker of the English Parliament, that he had taken many castles and vast quantities of cattle. A detachment crossed the Shannon, and Bunrati was burned by its garrison, though it had taken the Confederate Catholics much pains to win. We stormed and burned the Abbey of Adair, held by the rebels, where four friars were burned and three took prisoners. On 12 September he attacked the Rock of Cashel, the strong position of which had tempted many persons of both sexes to take refuge upon it, with their valuables. Failing to make a breach with his guns, in Shikin piled up turf against the wall of the enclosure and set fire to it. It was the dry season, and the heat disabled the defenders, who were crowded within a narrow space. The rock was carried by assault, and during the sacking of Cashel no quarter was given to anyone. About thirty priests and friars were among the slain. According to Ludlow 3,000 were slaughtered, the priests being taken even from under the altar. According to Father Sale, who was a native of Cashel, in Shikin donned the archiepiscopal mitre. At the beginning of November, fearing a juncture between the Munster chief and the victorious Michael Jones, the Confederate Catholics sent Lord Tuff into the county of Cork with 6,000 foot and 1,200 horse. In Shikine at once returned from Tipperary, leaving a garrison in Cahia, and came up with the invader at the hill of Nocknanus, about three miles east of Canturk. In a curious letter he offered to forego all advantage of ground, trusting to the goodness of his cause, and to fight in the open. Although his force was inferior, no answer was given, and in Shikin attacked and won the Battle of Nocknanus on 13 November. Taf lost two-thirds of his men and nearly all his arms, while the victor had only about 150 killed. In Shikine received the thanks of the English Parliament, and was voted £1,000 to buy horses, but he was already distrusted. Return to royal service. For a time in Shikine was master of the south of Ireland, and no one dared meet him in the field. At the beginning of February 1647-8 he took Carrick with a small force, threatened Waterford, and levied contributions to the walls of Kilkenny. He returned to Cork at the end of the month, and persuaded his officers to sign a remonstrance to the English House of Commons as to its neglect of the Munster army. This was received the 27th of March. 
and it was at first decided to send three members to confer with the discontented general, but on the 14th of April came news that he had actually declared for the king. The three members were recalled, all commissions made to Inshikin revoked, and officers and soldiers forbidden to obey him. He managed to keep his army together, while insisting on the necessity for Ormond's return to Ireland, and even sent an officer to Edinburgh with a proposal for joining the Scots with 6,000 men. Cork, Kinsale, Yule, Baltimore, Castle Haven, Crookhaven, and Dungarvan were in his hands and he so fortified these harbours that no parliamentary ship could anchor in any one of them. In spite of Rinaccini, Inshikin concluded a truce with the Confederate Catholics on the 22nd of May, and Ormond converted this into a peace in the following January. Owen Roe O'Neill advanced in July as far as Nina, his object being to reach Kerry, whose mountains were suited to his peculiar tactics and whose unguarded inlets would give him the means of communicating with the continent, but Inshikin forced him back to Ulster. Ormond, who was still the legal Lord Lieutenant, landed at Cork on 30 September, and he and Inshikin thenceforth worked together, Clan Ricard and Lord Preston siding with them as against the Nuncio Rinaccini and the Ulster General O'Neill. The Munster army had been buoyed up with the hopes of pay at Ormond's arrival, but he had only 30 pistoles and some of the disappointed cavalry left their colours with a view to joining either Jones or O'Neill. Inshikin quelled the mutiny with great skill and courage, and Ormond could only promise that the king would pay all arrears as soon as he could.